That wasn't so bad. No, that wasn't so bad. Uh, thank you, Tim. A uh, powerful testimony from Tim. And I, I do want to say thank you. you know, a lot of people have asked me how I feel, uh, you know, entering into the age of, of 40. And the two things came to my mind this morning, and it was just never better, never stronger. You know, and that I just am full of so many blessings. My life is so blessed. And a lot of that has to do with you as a church and, and also, you know, my family and my kids. And uh, I don't know if anyone saw the flash running around here this morning, but our son Benjamin has a flash costume on and him running in this morning and just saying, daddy, daddy, daddy. I mean, that's the best, uh, you know, birthday thing to ever get. But I got a great word for us today. I, I just want to, for our new people, want to just talk through uh, a couple things, just so you know a few things about us. This is some of the things you'll hear us say, and you'll see this on t-shirts that some of our, our volunteers wear, wear, and it's, uh, we're a church to call home and a family to call your own. That, that's really what we want to be for you guys, and, and we're a friendly church, and we, we just want to inspire you to seek Jesus. We're not here to get you saved. Uh, we're not here to, even, my job is not to change you. My job and, and our, our Sunday morning experience is really just so that you've got an opportunity to, for, for Jesus to be an experience for you. So if you've never had that, or you have a friend that's never had that, or it's, you felt like maybe it's been weird to invite them, this, we're here for them. We're here for that reason. So, and then another thing that we have coming up next Sunday is an event that we have. It's called Next. And this is a place where you can come and ask questions about who we are as a church, why we do the things that we do. And we can kind of tell you, uh, like Tim said, this is, this is authenticity. We want you to know who we are so that you can make a decision. Do I want to jump in with these people or do I want to turn around and jump out and get away from these people? And either one is fine. I just want you to be able to make that decision. And then I want to just really let you know that we've also, we have a big emphasis on community and community groups. And if you're not in a group, if you're not connected to a community, and our kind of, our hope is that everyone is in community with somebody else. That, that's really what we want. And so if you're lacking a community, we have a ton of options. And that little card that's on your seat um, that we'll go through is going to have a place where you can sign up for that. And in fact, our value card here that they'll put, this is a place where you can write a prayer request. You can sign up for Next that I talked about. You can put your name down and say, I want to join a community group or I just want to be introduced to people my own age or life and stage. You can fill this out. You can drop it. There's a little box as you go out the door. Uh, there's also an info table outside. You can leave it there at that table and we'll get in touch with you this week and get you set up on that. And then if you flip the card over and look at the other side, um, this is how you can give to South Point Church. And, and this is really important. This keeps the lights on, but this also just, to me, this is so important because you're telling us that you trust God with your money and you're telling us that you believe in the mission and vision of South Point Church. And that, that is, is really humbling for us. And me, our staff, our volunteers, our finance team, every tithe that comes in, we're absolutely blessed by it. And uh, yeah, it means a lot personally for me. The last thing for you is I've got a phone number here for you. This is our number 079-911-5552. This is, none of you open your emails, and I know because I can see who opens an email and doesn't open an email when we send it out. And so this is how we get information to you. So if you want to know about it, then uh, if you want to know about the things that are coming up, you want to know about the announcements, send a message to this and we will add you to the list. In fact, I carry this phone. I'm an extreme introvert. I will not spam your, you on WhatsApp. I will just send you a couple things in the week and let you know kind of what's coming up. So, all right. I'm excited to jump into the message today. And we've been in a series uh, that I, I've been titling, Who, Who's Your Plus One? And this is kind of a, a riff off of like a wedding invitation or a birthday invite where you're invited and then it says something on there like, Who's Your, who's your Plus One? Where you get to bring a, a plus one with you. And this is something that, that I actually started to pray about last year in November. And I started to ask God, you know, God, what is it that we as a church need to grow, to reach more people? What's next? for us as, as South Point Church? And what is it that I need to be doing in order for us to, to get to that next place? And God put two words on my heart. He put the word discipleship and he put the word direction. Those two words he put on my heart. I was standing out in the foyer and as I was walking in, those two words popped in on my heart. And I could see kind of this, this vision, this idea of people leaving the service on a Sunday morning 
And God just said, you're more than just this. This is a a set up experience for you to encounter Jesus. But when you walk out those doors, there's more to it. And so last week we talked about discipleship and I broke down what the, what the meaning of that word is. And I, I challenged you. I really encouraged you. Actually, it was, it was a direct challenge. I don't think I could have been more clear, but I asked everybody, go through your phone, look in your contact list, pick one person, set a reminder on your phone to send them one WhatsApp message every single week at the same time and just start building relationship with them. And we called that like level one discipleship. That's all the friction is taken away. All the awkwardness is taken away. You don't have to be super spiritual. It's just a contact point. And I I hope that you guys have been doing that. And if you have been doing that, I would say just keep doing it. Don't give up on that person. You will see fruit from it. I I absolutely promise. Now, today we're going to be talking about direction. And and more specifically, we're going to be talking about vision. And so what I realized is is that I had, had not cast vision for us as a church and that we know who we are. So we know who we are at South Point Church. We know that we're a church for people to call home, a family to call their own. We know what we are. We know that we're a friendly church, that we're a a safe environment for people to come and, and have an encounter with Jesus. We know why we do the things that we do because we love people. We love people even more when, they, when, when we get to see them have this encounter with, with a heavenly father, with a savior that loves them so much. But one of the questions that we couldn't answer, that I could not answer, and when I asked people these questions, this last question, but where are we going? There wasn't a very clear answer for that. And I, I didn't even have a very clear answer for that. And we need to know where we're going because if you don't know where you're going or what it is that you're working towards, then you don't know how to define your win. You also don't know what team you're on. You you don't know, like, where's our general direction? See, where you're going, your vision, your direction, kind of really defines a lot of, like, how you do things along the way and the process along the way. So vision is really important, and we're going to talk about that today. But before we do, I'm going to give everybody an an eye test. So I'm going to put some things on the screen, and you're going to tell me what you see. So Josh, put that first picture on there. Hey, what number do you see here? Okay, 42. Okay, Josh, you can put the next one up. Okay, what number do you see here? 34. Fantastic. Okay, the the next one goes up here. Okay. Some of you stuttered. Some of you stuttered. All right, and then the last last one here, what number do you see here? Penguin. Who said penguin? you You got it right. Now, I hope... That I hope someone in this room realized today that they're colorblind. Uh, and then at the end of the service, at the end of the service, we'll pray over you and God will heal you. I believe in, I be, I believe in that. Now, you know, vision's really important. And, and this, this to me is just kind of a, a silly way to kind of illustrate like how important it is and, and what you see is important. And sometimes it's harder for people to see certain vision. It's harder for people to see, you know, different colors if, you're, if, you, if you are colorblind. But I want to give you a, a definitive definition for vision. So vision, as by, by me, vision is a picture of the future that produces a passion in the present. So I mean, somebody needs to take a picture of that or write that down. Vision is a picture of the future that produces a passion in the present. Are you lacking passion in your life right now? Well, maybe you need a picture of your future that can inspire that passion. See, vision is very much attached to passion. And see, what we do is we kind of get it wrong because we think in our lives that that we need to find purpose and we need to find meaning in our life. But really, it's not purpose and meaning in our life that we need. We just really lack vision. We lack something that, that makes us passionate. And so we walk around and we look for, what is it that I'm meant to be? What is it that I'm meant to do? What's my purpose? My purpose is to be a mom. My purpose is to be a dad. Or my purpose is to provide for my family. What is the meaning of life? What's the meaning of my life? I feel lost. I feel stuck. I feel like I don't know what's coming up next, you know, for me. What, 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 what's the meaning? What's my meaning in life? And see, we're trying to find 
purpose and meaning. We're desperately seeking it. That's what drives us into bars. That's what drives us into bad relationships. That's what drives us into addictions and into bad habits is this desire for meaning and this desire for purpose when really you're looking for the wrong thing. Because what I want you to look for is vision. And see, a church can do the same thing. As a church, we can waffle. We can look for purpose. We can look for meaning. But we don't need to look for purpose and meaning. We already have that. God's given us that. God's given you purpose. He's given you meaning. It's actually quite simple. But it's the vision that separates us. It's the vision that drives us. Because there's a picture in your future that makes you feel passionate today. And I hope that that's something that inspires you to walk out of here and think, If I don't have that picture of the future that makes me passionate today, I'm going to start to wonder what that is. See, that's what drove me into missions, drove me to quit my job, to raise money, to move to South Africa, to to marry a, a crazy lady named Casey, to, you know, move to Cape Town, all that stuff. Because there was a, a picture in my future that I could see that made me passionate about those decisions. And I have a picture of what I can see about our church, and it makes me passionate today. So that's my definition for vision, but I want to give you a kind of a spiritual twist on this. The, The spiritual definition for vision is God's picture of the future that he created for us. Now, why would you want God's vision? Why should we want his vision rather than, than our vision? Why is it that's that, that God's vision is better for you than our, than my vision is better for me? Why is his picture better than my picture? Because I can paint my own picture for my life, but God has also painted a picture. And I just would say, like, if you look at the the stars in the sky, if you look at uh, the beauty of this country and think, like, there's so much beauty just in the mountain and in the stars and in the sky, and Jesus didn't even come and die for those things. He came and he died for us. See, God had a plan for us. He had a plan for us. We messed that plan up with sin. Then he went through this whole journey of restoring us and loving on us. And he sent Jesus to love on us and to restore us into grace. So what would be better? My own limited picture of my future or maybe the picture that the creator, the savior, the one that encompassed and embodied love, the one that encompassed and embodied sacrifice for you, the one that changes lives, the one that performs miracles, the one that that opens up doors where you never thought a door would open up, the one that loves you and is there for you in your darkest moments. Is that not the one that you want to paint the picture that makes you passionate today? See, that's why I believe that, that we should want God's vision. We should want his plan for our future over our own. It's, it's God's vision. Now, like I said earlier, it, it, it's, not, it's not my desire, it's not my purpose to, to make you accept God's vision for your life. It, that's not why I'm up here. But I hope to inspire you to think about it and inspire you to consider it. And so I want you to know what God's plan can do, what God's picture can do for you. See, God's picture, and Josh, put that slide up there. What, what God's picture can do for you is, is more than you even know and you even understand. And see, I, I don't ever want you to take for granted, uh, I don't want to take for granted that, that you just believe everything that I say up here and that you know uh, everything that I say, you know, like is, is truth and you just are going to accept it. And I like to ask myself the question and think like, but why does this matter to you? You know, you sitting there in the audience watching this happen up here, it's like, why should, you, why should you choose God's vision? You know, I just told you that you should choose God's vision because there's a moon in the sky and there's the Grand Canyon and, and there's, if you've ever driven through Namibia and the West Coast and all this beauty on earth and, and God created all that. But if you don't believe in God, then none of that really matters. And if you don't believe in God, I want you to know that that's okay. This is a safe space for you to be in. You don't have to accept that because Jesus is your creator and he loves you and he died for you, if you don't believe that, there's still a reason for you to want to know what God's picture for you can do. And I promise that, that it is an absolutely amazing picture. And so I'm going to give you some things that the Bible says that God's picture, God's vision for you 
can do for you and how it's good for you and how it's freeing for you. So we're going to go through these. See, what God's picture can do for you, the first thing God's picture can do for you is it can help you get things done. And I've got here Nehemiah and Zechariah. See, we, we, we've been talking about uh, the, the Israelites and we talked about Nebuchadnezzar and, and Babylon and Jerusalem. And, and basically Jerusalem was God's city and then Jerusalem ended up uh, getting conquered because they kind of stepped away from God. They stepped away from worshiping God. And so God raised up the Babylonians and they came in and they just smashed the city of Jerusalem. They just completely took it out. And they took everybody captive. And that's where Daniel was taken captive. And Daniel was put in the lion's den and all of that stuff happened. But they were pulled out of, out of Jerusalem and they were taken captive in, in Babylon. And then after the Babylonian empire kind of broke apart and people started returning back to Jerusalem... They found that the city was in complete ruin. And Nehemiah, when he found out that the walls around the city were completely destroyed, meaning that it could be invaded, it could be destroyed, it wasn't safe, he went in and he was inspired because God gave him a vision for the restoration of the city of Jerusalem. And he was inspired then and he raised up people and they rebuilt the wall in record time. See, it's, it's vision that helped Nehemiah get that done. And then for Zechariah, it's kind of the same thing happened with him, but Zechariah was focused on the city, on Jerusalem. And so Zechariah comes in and he has this vision from God that Jerusalem is, is God's chosen city. It's, it's a holy city and he wants it to be restored back to that. And he has a vision for it. And so he comes in and he starts to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city. But none of that would have happened if it wasn't for the vision, the direction, the purpose so God's vision helps us to get things done. When God gives you a vision, when God gives South Point Church a vision, it helps get things done. You're sitting in a building right now that came from someone bef that came before me, elders and members and many of you in here, that you had a vision for a home base, for South Point to have uh, a home and not to be mobile anymore. And that vision helped you get a lot of things done. And this building was gutted and built and painted and carpeted and the chairs were put down. And some of you have emotional scars from that time because you were just abused like child labor and you were worked, you know, to the bone. And, and I know for a long time they came in here and Sunday morning, they would correct me if I'm wrong. You would worship, have like a service in here in the dust and the concrete. And then when ch church was done, you would go to work. And, and that's very similar to what Nehemiah and Zechariah did. See, vision helps you get things done. The, the next thing that it does is vision, it motivates us and it, and it guides us. And see, here in Romans 15, 20 through 22, it talks about Paul here being motivated and guided to take the gospel out to the Gentile people. See, if it wasn't for God's vision for people that were living in sin to be restored back to Jesus then Paul would have never been changed. He would have never had the moment where he, he changed from Saul to Paul. And then Paul went out and he took the gospel to the Gentiles, which is all the people that weren't Jewish. So that whole back half of your Bible, almost, was written by Paul, who was traveling around. Paul was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was persecuted, he was put in prison, he was starved. Uh, he almost died of, of exposure to cold weather. I mean, it, it was so bad that nobody wanted to get on a boat with Paul because every boat he got on crashed and would, would be shipwrecked. But Paul continued on and on and on and on because he was motivated and guided by the vision that God had given him for the Gentile people. You are sitting here today able to, uh, able to accept the gospel message of Jesus Christ because of what Paul began to do to establish the church outside of the Jewish community. You see, vision also, it, it can give you a different perspective on your life. And if we look in Acts chapter 10, what happens here is, is Peter is praying. And Peter, if you don't know, he was one of the disciples. And Peter, kind of unlike Paul, see, Paul got sent to like the dirty, grungy, you know, sinners, which is kind of ironic because Paul was walking around persecuting Christians that weren't Jewish. And then God said, okay, now I'm going to change you and you're going to take the gospel to those people instead. But Peter, he left to deal with, with the Jews. And I don't know if that was a blessing or if that was a curse, but 
But Peter is working with them, and one of their, their laws and their cultures was that they couldn't eat certain food. And so one night, Peter is praying. And while he's praying, he has a, a, a vision, and coming down from heaven is all the, the unclean, like, animals and food. And that's just falling down, and Peter has this moment with God, and Peter says, I can't eat that food. And God says, no, you can eat that food. And Peter says, no, I can't eat that food. And God says, are you telling me that you can't eat something that I created for you? Or that I created, you tell me that I made an unclean thing? And Peter's like, okay, fine. I, I accept that, I'll eat it. But see, what ended up happening is right after that dream, Peter would have a meal with three Gentiles that he could then sit down and eat with because his perspective had been changed. See, vision can also, it, it helps a leader have a bold vision. When a leader has a bold vision, then they can kind of accomplish great goals. And we, we look at a story in Chronicles here, and, and this is David. David rebuilt, or David building the temple for Jesus. And so Jesus, or not Jesus, but, but for God, David is, is building this, this massive, beautiful, wonderful temple for God. And Josh, put that on the screen here for me. God didn't have a resting place yet. He'd been carried around in the tabernacle. And then David gets this vision. I want God to have a temple, a home. And see, this is before Jesus came. After Jesus, we are God's home. We are Jesus' home. He, he resides within us. Not in this building, but within us. And before that happened, David said, I want to start that process. And then his son would end up finishing that process. But it was a bold vision and it was a great goal that was accomplished see another thing that vision does for you is it gives you see clear vision it's the actually the key to your success it defines your win that's what we talked about before it goes back to nehemiah nehemiah had a clear vision on a wall did you know that while nehemiah was rebuilding the wall there were people that were trying to stop the rebuilding of the wall and if you read the story in the bible it talks about how they were working in one hand and they had a weapon in the other hand they were at the same time that they were rebuilding the wall, they were also ready to fight, to defend that wall that they were rebuilding. And that comes because they knew the win. The win was to get that wall rebuilt and they had a clear vision and it led them to success. Vision also, it eliminates worry. And this is one of the, the, the best Bible verses for you. Josh, put worry on the screen here. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Worry is something that consumes your life. It's something that consumes us. And here in Matthew 6, and I, I list these verses so you can, you know, find this on YouTube and you can go back and look these up. But God says, why are you worried about what you're going to wear? Why are you worried about the clothes that are going to be on your back or the food that you're going to eat? Don't you know how much I love you? Don't you know that I take care of the birds out in the sky? You know the birds, they don't worry about what they're going to eat. So why are you worried? Bring all your worries and cares to me. When you bring all your worries and cares to me, I'll take care of it. See, it was God's direction and his vision for you to love you, to care for you, to be your heavenly father. That's why worry can be eliminated. I've got a couple more for you. V vision, it, it helps you eliminate or it helps you to see things in your true and proper perspective. And see, th this, this Daniel chapter 4 here, we talked about this a couple weeks ago in our, uh, you won't believe that this is in the Bible. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar, and he went crazy, and he ended up uh, living as, a, as an ox, eating grass and, and sleeping outside at night, and his fingernails grew out, and his body was covered in hair, and he, he went mad. He lost his mind. And when he was returned to his kingship, it was the moment where his perspective changed. And there was a moment where he looked up and he finally said, okay, God, I get it. You are God, the God, the only God. I accept it. And then immediately when he saw the proper perspective, the truth, he was restored back to kingship. You know, vision also, it, it inspires hope. I mean, this is something that we all need in our life. And in Deuteronomy 11.9, Josh, put that on the screen there. In Deuteronomy 11.9, it talks about how the, the Israelites are walking into and working into a city, into the promised land. 
And they're a little bit discouraged because it's not been an easy journey. But because God had a vision all the way back with Abraham, that vision with Abraham, that I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a great and powerful nation. You'll have more descendants than you have stars in the sky. That vision there. In Deuteronomy 11:9, God reminds the people, he says, hey, just remember that this is a land that you will prosper in because it, it is flowing with milk and honey. See, God's vision for his people, it inspired hope when they needed it the most. Also, and I think this is the last one for you, is that it will sustain you. So Hebrews eleven twenty seven talks about Moses. Moses, the great leader. He's the guy that picked up all the Israelites from Egypt. And he took all the Israelites and they wandered around in the desert for 40 years. And I know there were a lot of times when Moses was, you know, didn't have hope. And it was because the, these Israelites, when they were going from miracle to miracle to miracle, you know, they'd say, I'm hungry. So God would give them manna. And they'd say, I'm thirsty. So he struck a rock and water came out of the rock. And they would say, no, we want different food. And it just makes me think about my wife driving around in our van and our kids in the back seat being like, I'm hungry, mom. Why can't we get there sooner? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Uh, mom, I need a juice. Mom, I spilt this. My brother won't stop touching me. You know, all that arguing and bickering that's happening in the van is basically what Moses was dealing with, but not just a van full. He's dealing with an entire nation that was doing that. And as hard as it was, God's vision, God's direction for the people of Israel, where he wanted them to be, sustained Moses. He, Moses, you just hang in there. You just hang in there. And he would just take care of Moses. Moses would go to God and say, God, I don't know how to deal with these people. Please help me. And God would sustain him. So see, what I've done is I've given you a, a survey through the Bible of what God's vision, what God's direction can, can do for, for you based on the example that we've seen that he's done in the scripture and in the Bible. But in order for us to really kind of grasp what it can do for us here at, at South Point, and like I said, vision is hard, direction's hard. And over the next couple of weeks, I'm really inspiring, hopefully inspiring us to, to seek out our direction. And when I ask people, where do you see you know, South Point going? It's kind of a hard question to answer because it's, it's very broad. So I want you to know how big I'm dreaming. I want you to know how big I'm thinking. So when I think about direction and vision for South Point Church, th these are the things that I think about. I think about that we have a community in every single suburb in, in Cape Town. That we have a community group, we have a presence, we have a church plant, we have a campus, we've got a kid stuff event, but it's every single community in Cape Town has some representation from South Point Church that's feeding into and pouring into that community. I think about our family ministry program. Why can we not launch campuses based on our, our kids programs? I mean, for those of you that have kids back there, maybe you're here on Friday night, for kid stuff, you saw something amazing. A lot of you come because your kids get you out of bed and they bring you here. They're better uh, church attenders than, than their parents are. And they drag you here because they love it. So why on earth can we not be a church that instead of buying a building and going through a complicated process, why can we not just go start a children's ministry in a school somewhere and then the adults say, hey, this is great for the kids. Maybe I want something. And then we start to do something for them. And then before we know it, we do have a church there. We do have a gathering of people being inspired by Jesus. But why can it not start through family ministry? And I, I told all of our volunteers working with family ministry, I said, if you dream it, let's go do it. See, I want us to have big dreams and big vision. Why, why can we not make it a goal to, what if we baptize 365 people in a year because it represents one baptism every single day? See, so many people, I've said this and someone has told me out loud, it's not smart to come up with unrealistic goals and vision because it sets people up for failure. Praise God that this is unrealistic and unable to do in my own might, right? I, I think we need to start dreaming and thinking about the things that everyone else looks at us and says, you're absolutely insane. How are you gonna do that? How, I'm not afraid to put before you something big and something bold. 
You know, we should be a church when we live in a city of 4 million people. I'm not even happy with 365 people a year giving their life to Jesus. Why can it not be double and triple and even more than that? Well, it's, it's not that right now because we've not accepted the vision for that, the direction for that. You know, why, why can we not be planting, you know, X number of churches a year? Why, why can we not be debt free as a church? And then we go out and we help other churches become debt free. What if we just started going around and paying off other churches debt? See, these are the things that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking, what is it that God is asking South Point Church to do? What is it that we can take out and we can impact the world with? We can impact our community with. And I want them to be crazy. I want us to come up with crazy big dreams that don't make any sense. You know, it didn't make sense to me when God said, I want you to quit your job, give up your, your very nice salary, give up all the work that you've done, take your last paycheck, go raise a bunch of money, and go live in Africa. That didn't make any sense on earth. And in fact, I remember my dad, my, I, my dad's great and he's wonderful and I love him, but my dad was like, that's not a good idea. You know, because I was set. I had money, had a car, was saving for a house. It was like the American dream, everything perfect. But I knew that God's picture for me was better than my picture for me. And when I thought of God's future picture for me, it made me passionate in that season. And I started to think about what is the most undoable, absolutely crazy thing that gets me excited? Okay, that's what I want. That's my vision. And I'm just going to keep plugging away and charging and charging and charging and charging until that happens and it comes true. So church, what are we going to do? What are we going to be? See, I've got a quote here for you that changed my life. And it's, if your dreams, if your vision, if your passion... If it's not impossible to you, then maybe it's, it's offensive to God. See, I think God is saying, I dare you to outdream me. I dare you to outvision me. I dare you to have more passion for your city, for your neighbors. I dare you to try and have a more inspiring picture for your future than I can come up for you. I dare you. We'll never outdream God. And in fact, when you come, that, that's why I love that baptism thing. Because if I said, we're going to baptize 40 people in the next year, I can find a way to make that happen. We can have X number of services that focus on baptism in this way. And we can have these big drives and we can do this stuff. And boom, we can get our 40 people. But I can't come up with a way to baptize 365 people in a year. Okay, now I'm in God's territory. So where do we want to be? We want to be in our territory or we want to be in God's territory? Do we want our picture for the future, which is safe, it's doable, it's understandable? You could come up with a plan to get there. Or do we want God's picture? See, when God made you, he made you with a purpose. Not a single person in this room, not a single purpose on earth has been made on accident. You, well, actually, some of you were accidents, <laughs> to, be, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. But you weren't an accident to God. All right. And when God made you, I don't believe that he said, I'm not going to put a purpose in this one. This one, I'm just going to let grow up and exist and just die when they get old. God didn't say that for any of you. And see, so many of us, we are looking for purpose. We are looking for meaning. Meanwhile, God is sitting there next to you, screaming at you, going, just, I dare you to ask me for that picture because I will give you passion today for the picture that I have for you in your life. If you feel stuck in your job, your marriage, your relationships, if you feel stuck here at church serving and volunteering and tithing and showing up every single Sunday, I dare you to ask God to give you a picture. I dare you to ask God, God, plant a dream in my heart, a dream in my mind. Let me see a glimmer of what your picture for me could be. The best way for you to get unstuck in your life is to dare God to show you his picture for your life and let that passion rise up in you. And then what happens when we, as an entire church, pursue that? See, when God gave me the words discipleship and direction and vision, 
God didn't say, Chris, you go tell the church where we're going. See, I, I do know where we as South Point Church are going. And it's a lot of what was on the screen there. And, and if somebody comes to me and says, no, we can do that, then, I'm, I, then you know what my next thought's going to be? It's too doable. I, I, want, I want to come up with things where people stop coming to me and saying, we can do that. Because I want to, I want to push, push, push for God. But I'm not going to tell you what that is. Not yet, at least. Because what God really told me to do is he told me to challenge you. Because when everyone in this room and, and everyone at church gets the idea and catches a glimmer of what God can do in your life through vision, through direction, how he can take passion and, and just burn passion inside your heart that changes you, it changes your, your attitude and your outlook on every single thing in your life. And then when we all come together in this building and we take that mentality that we know works in our personal lives and we show up here together collectively and we combine that belief that we all have, those, those shared experiences that God is so big that he can do these things that we think are impossible, then, I mean, Cape Town, you better watch out because we're coming and we're growing and we're gonna continue to push and push and push. And the reason that I wanna do that is because there's always one more person out there that needs Jesus. You're a person in your chair that at some point in time in your life, you didn't have Jesus. Now you do. And that's why we keep doing this. There's always one more person. And until everyone is saved or until we're raptured or we all die or whatever happens, we're just going to keep going. And that's why my vision and God's vision is more than just Pinelands. It's more than just Cape Town. It's, it's more than the Western Cape. It's more than South Africa. You know, we, why, we can be flooding missionaries everywhere. That's another thing that we could do as a vision. Why are we not sending missionaries out? Well, because we, just have, we don't have the vision for it yet. But it is, it is coming. See, we're in a special place as a church. It's okay that we're learning how to disciple and it's okay that we're learning how to develop vision because we've come a long way as a church. You know, coming through COVID and growing and then, we, you know, basically a new church is birthed out of an existing church and all the existing people stayed and everyone loves everybody. I mean, that's what's so amazing and so great. And so in November, when I asked God what's next for us, it wasn't like, like a sad conviction, like, God, what... This church is dying. What's wrong here? How do we save it? No, it's me just saying, all right, Lord, what do you, let's go. Give me something. Give me what's next. And so how, how encouraging and how honoring is it that God is saying to us, hey, I want you to dream bigger dreams about where you're going to go. And I want you to get better at taking people with you. And I want you to get better at impacting those that you go to. I mean, that's the two best words that God could have given us. Now, I've got a verse in Zechariah here that, that I just absolutely love. Now, this, is, this verse is not about Cape Town, but this verse is about God's city, about Jerusalem. But I believe that what God speaks over Jerusalem, after Jesus' coming, he also desires for our city as well. And so I want to use this verse to encourage a vision for us over our city here at Cape Town. So look at this. Thus says the Lord, I shall return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. So God is saying, my presence is gonna to return to the city of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city of truth. So God's speaking the city of truth over Jerusalem. And the mountain, who else has a mountain next to their city? Hmm, I wonder who that is. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy Mountain. Did you know that before Casey and I moved to Cape Town, when we were praying about, uh, about what city to come to, God gave Casey a vision of a table with a tablecloth being draped over it. And God said, the table is prepared for you. And guess what? Table Mountain has a tablecloth, right? It's the clouds and we call it the tablecloth. And here we have God saying, a holy mountain in a city of truth. Guys, are you, can we see the vision for us? 
Can we start to see that vision for, for Cape Town and for beyond? And then, and then look at how beautiful this is. Look at the next verse here. And man, we desire this. In this next verse, verse four, thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women will again sit in the streets in public places in Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of his advanced age. And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in its streets. Guys, we, this, is, this, is, this doesn't have to be a torn city and a torn nation where we're afraid of our streets. This can be a, a healed nation. And I don't want to be arrogant and say, we're going to heal it tomorrow. But, but what I do want to say is that God cared enough about Jerusalem to make it a beautiful place for the elderly people to sit outside and enjoy a sunny day and for the streets to be filled with laughter with boys and girls playing in the streets. And so why, why, why do we not think that that's also for us here? And God even says that in the next verse. God goes on to say this through Zechariah. says, thus says the Lord, if it is difficult in the eyes of the remnants of this people in those days, basically saying, if you can't see it, Jerusalem, if you can't see the vision for this, South Point, if you can't see the vision for this, God says, is it also going to be difficult for me? The answer is no. And God is saying in this verse here, he's saying that, that you may not see it, but I can. That's the perfect place to be. Because if we can see it, then we can do it. But we need something that we can't see so that we know that only God can do it. So I want to remind you, spiritual vision. Spiritual vision is, is this. Spiritual vision is God's picture. Put this up there for him, Josh. Spiritual vision is God's picture of the future that he created for us. What is God's picture for this city, for this church, for your life that he's created for us? And now, my, my last point, and this is, this is critical, because we think this is great, this sounds wonderful, I love all this, but here's the question. How do we capture God's vision? How do we capture God's vision and how do we picture, how do we see the picture that he's made for us? Josh, put this up there for him because I want you guys to read and see this here. How do we capture, because this is where we'll get hung up. It's easy to get fired up and rallied up in here and then when you walk out there and you go home, and you start to think about it, it's like, but I, how do I do that? How, what, what is it that, like, you know, it feels, you don't know what to do. Do I, do I pray? Do I ask God about it? Should I feel goosebumps when God does it or says something to me? Should I get the, the shivers or should I, you know, speak in tongues or should I, like, is God going to, is the dog going to walk up and instead of barking, he's going to speak and he's going to say, Tim, I need you to do, you know, whatever. Now, you know, so how, how do we see this? Well, it, it's actually very easy. It, see, it's only when we empty ourselves of our opinions and our dreams of the future that God can fill us up with his picture. See, we got to empty out. So what that means is that when you think that 365 baptisms is impossible and it's going to discourage everybody else, you just empty that opinion. Nope, not going to have that opinion. When you think that, that what God is speaking over your life, the vision that he's given you for you, when you think there is no way that I'm going to get to that place, to that point, you just empty it out. Get rid of your opinions. Get rid of your thoughts. Get rid of, of you. Just dump it. Dump it out. Empty it out. And then you come to God and you say, Lord, fill me with your vision. And I'll tell you how simple this is. I, I, was, I was sitting in the grass in a state park. And as I was sitting there in, in, in the grass, I had been working on this idea of I want God's picture for my future. But I was struggling. I was really struggling to just see how it was going to work. Because I couldn't understand how I was going to raise all this money, how I was going to live without, you know, a, a paycheck, how I just didn't get it. I couldn't figure it out. And I, I had been on a, on a trail run and I was sitting there, it was a hot day and I was just kind of enjoying the, the afternoon. And I had my, my dog with me at the time and we were, it'd been swimming in the lake. And, and I just, I just decided in that moment, I'll never, I even remember how the grass and the sun felt. And in that moment, I just said, you know what? It doesn't matter how it happens or whether I can see it or can't see it. God, let's just, let's go. And then I just asked God, what's the next thing for me? 
And for me, the next thing was to say, all right, Lord, I don't need to know the next step, but I accept that you've got a picture for me that I don't, un I don't understand, but I'm passionate about it. So you can do that in your prayer time. You can do that uh, by, by just sitting there and saying, and I said this last week, I'm gonna make it real easy for you. You go home and you sit and, you're, and it, take a moment of prayer. Even if you don't pray, just find somewhere to sit and sit down and say, Pastor Chris, say, God, Pastor Chris told me to sit down and tell you that I wanna know how to see your picture for my life, but I don't know how to do it. So I'm just gonna sit here and tell you that. And there you go. It's, I mean, it's that simple. Watch God work in your life. Watch God start to reveal things to you. Watch God start to encourage you. Watch God start to put little seeds of thought in your mind. Watch God start to put vision in your heart. Watch God start to ignite passion in you that you haven't had before. See, God, God's gonna do it. I'm not worried that God's gonna leave me hanging out on the limb here where I've made you a promise that can't be backed up because I know without a doubt that there will be 100% fruit in your life and in the life of this church if we do this. Now, this Sunday, I've got one more picture here for you. And we've got a couple more things. And it's, it's a little bit of a longer service because we're adding th this element here onto the end of it. Th this is, a, this is a, a thing that we're kind of come up with. And this is how we practically operate in our vision here in, in church. If you don't know how to see this in your life or, or how to pursue this, we can give you an opportunity to do, it, to do it here. But you heard Tim's story and you're about to hear Roger's story here in just a second. And, and serving, volunteering, this is one of the best ways to watch God reveal vision and passion to you. And we've got a lot of ways to do that. Production, worship, stage design and building props, pastoral care, welcome team, hosting team. Kids age one through six, kids uh, grades one through four, grades five through seven, and in high school. Now, listen, all that stuff that I said that South Point could be, all that stuff that I said that we could impact the city with, guess what it takes? It takes people. So how do we change, how do we change the, the climate of Christianity in our school systems? I need people here. How, how do we change someone's relationship with, with church or relationship with Hertz? Guess what? I need people on our welcome and hosting team. How is it that, that we create an experience in here on a Sunday morning where somebody can have an encounter with God on their worst day? Guess what? I need people in production and worship. You know, how, how do we improve our environment here? I mean, we've got a beautiful cross hanging on the wall. We had the stage painted by some wonderful ladies. And all that happened because someone said, you know, I can design or build something that can make this a better experience. This here is not you doing something for me or for this church. This here is your opportunity to do something for you so that God starts to awaken a vision in you. How do you ask God for a vision for South Point Church for direction if you're not involved in it? So we believe that a bunch of people are going to get involved in it. And so before I call uh, the band up here and, and we move on to the next part, on the, they're going to raise the lights. And Philippe, you can pull the lights up. And on this back wall back here in the corner, we've got that, that beautiful sign. And we've got tables there in front of it. And we're going to have, at the end of the service, we're going to have volunteers that are, that are going to be there. And those volunteers are going to represent the areas. And we've made this dummy proof. They're going to wear a, a literal sign on their chest that says these words. So all you have to do is walk up and say, uh, that person. And then they're going to give you a little card to fill out and, and answer some questions. And if you fill out a card, you're not signing your life away in blood. I promise you can still back out. But we just, we just want you to be a part of this because if you're going to be invited into the vision of where we're going at South Point Church, I would like for you to spend a season contributing to it. Get to know us. Serve in it. And there's a ton of ways to do that. And so, um, uh, Philippe, team, we're, we're going to just, we're going to bypass this song because I've, I've spoken for too long. But I, I want to bring Roger Wood up on stage. And 
after Roger shares his testimony, I'm going to dismiss you guys. And when I dismiss you guys, we're going to have a bunch of volunteers here in the back. And we've got tables set up so that if people have questions, they can kind of move to the side and they can fill things out. And we have a card for everyone. We've made this so foolproof uh, for you guys to sign up. But I want you to hear one more story of how vision and, and God's direction has impacted another volunteer. So come on out, Roger. This is what happens when the pastor talks for too long and changes the plan mid, mid-sermon. Over to you, Roger. So I don't have 25 minutes anymore, Chris? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, Chris was telling, uh, talking about uh, who prompts you to go and serve. Well, many years ago, my wife, Faye, said to me, um, can you just spend one year with the two- and three-year-olds? This was at another church. And I said, uh, but I'm already serving in the, in the older section, you know, Kathy's sort of age group there at Upstreet. And um, she said, there are no male leaders there at all. So I, I really would like you to come and be an influence for those young boys particularly, or for those children who don't have a father figure at home. And so I got involved there all those years ago. Um, I just want to read a section from Matthew Uh, which was really prompting me to be of service in this area, in this age group in Wumberland. And Jesus called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. And, and that's really what we do at Wumberland. We, we welcome the boys and girls. They come from different family backgrounds. Um, some of them have mom and dad at home. Some of them are, are foster children. And, uh, but that doesn't um, influence how much we love them. So we, we uh, try to build trust with them because we want to give them the most important message that we think we can give them, and that is that Jesus loves them, and he wants to be their friend forever. That was our story today about uh, Saul coming to faith uh, on that road to Damascus, and the light blinded him, and uh, somehow, and the voice spoke from heaven, and somehow God was able to change his life around. So we would love it if those boys and girls could turn to Jesus. And, and that's why I serve there. Um, it, it gives me a, a special kick when, when a child runs up to me and says, why weren't you in Wumberland this morning? That's when I'm in church. Um, because they, they miss us. And, and they, they, they've built relationships. They've built trust. And uh, so we, we trust that they will uh, learn to love Jesus too. So I hope that will really encourage you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Roger. Um, you know, Roger's a guy that a couple years ago, coming out of COVID, we didn't even know if we would still be able to keep the building. And we were having a, a, a meeting to kind of say, hey, we believe in the church. We believe in it. Roger interrupts the meeting and runs up on stage and says, I need to share a story with you about what's happened in, a, in, the, life of a, in the life of a child. And so Roger shares his story. Tim shares his story, not because it benefits us, but because it it instills, helps you find vision for you. This, this opportunity for you to sign up and serve somewhere in our church is so you can start to discover the passion, the picture that God has put in your life. And if you don't know how to do it, it's easy. Go pick a spot, put your name down and watch God work in your life. This is for you. And so thank you, Roger. I, I'm going to dismiss this here and um, take time take a look at that sign. Take a chance. Do something that you don't think you can do and let God paint a passionate picture for you. So guys, thank you for coming. We're a friendly church. We're a church for you. We have tea and coffee as well. Um, We hope that you have an amazing Sunday. Everybody can celebrate my birthday on your own at your house and you guys can be dismissed.